time for some introductions. We are pleased to have with us today three engaging presenters. Alyssa Bruce is a multidisciplinary land professional with over 15 years of progressive experience in land asset administration and management in the upstream oil and gas industry. She is an alumni of the University of Calgary. She has a Bachelor of Commerce degree with a concentration in risk management and finance and a Master's of Science in Sustainable Energy Development as well. Alyssa is currently exploring opportunities to leverage her education and skills in Alberta's growing renewable energy sector. She is the writer of Brownfields to Brightfields, repurposing Alberta's unreclaimed oil and gas sites for solar PV, and will be giving us a lay of the land today as we explore the intersect of renewables with oil and gas. Welcome, Alyssa. Keith Hershey is the president of the Renew Well Project. The Renew Well Project utilizes orphaned wells as brownfield sites for solar, wind, and or geothermal developments. The solutions Renew Well offers can also apply to operating fields by providing low cost electricity for ongoing production while improving the overall carbon intensity of those operations. Keith himself is a fourth generation Albertan, second generation in the oil and gas industry, and the originator of the Renew Well Project. Over the course of his career, he provided research support for in situ oil sands production, managed software development, and played key roles in several consortia, including Canada's first CO2 sequestration enhanced oil recovery project. Keith was introduced to renewable energy technology in 2003 while visiting extended family in Denmark. Later that year, he founded Elemental Energy Inc. to explore how conventional and renewable energy systems could be combined for a more sustainable future. Since 2016, he has worked with key stakeholders to create economic, environmental and social benefits by repurposing Alberta's legacy oil and gas infrastructure to be a foundation for renewable energy development. Welcome to And Dave Kelly, he is the CEO of Skyfire Energy. Skyfire started installing solar PV systems in 2001 when solar was still in its infancy in Canada. Since then, they have completed over 1,700 renewable energy systems across Canada and have solar, B solar PV systems in operation within more than 20 utilities in Canada. Skyfire is the installer for the Renewell project and also, as mentioned, the, the sponsor of our webinar today. David himself has been actively involved in combining renewables with oil and gas operations for several years. He is a solar veteran with 20 years of experience in the business. Dave is a professional engineer and leads a diverse team at Skyfire Energy. David has served on the board of Cansia and Solar Alberta and continues to participate actively in the industry associations. Welcome Dave and thank you all for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn over the mic to Alyssa Bruce to begin our presentation. ...representative for the project, and I'm truly honored to be presenting alongside Keith and David today. Global energy, is forecasted, global energy demand is forecasted to increase over the coming decades, and oil and gas resources continue to play an important role in the transition to a decarbonized energy system. The oil and gas industry is faced with the challenge of cost-effectively managing increasing energy requirements to conduct its activities, and policy, social, and investor pressure to reduce emissions. There are several opportunities to integrate renewable energy technology as part of the decarbonization strategy. In these times where polarized dialogue seems to dominate, I'm encouraged by the end to present some examples of solar and energy storage projects currently proposed or underway in Alberta. Climate change, which is evidenced by the rate of increase in global mean temperature, has been called a wicked problem due to the complexities, contradictions, and uncertainties surrounding its mitigation as well as its interconnectedness with other global issues. The adverse effects from climate change are predicted to vary over time across regions and with the ability of each region to mitigate or adapt. It is recognized that reducing greenhouse gas or GHG emissions from human activity is key to mitigating climate change and achieving the Paris Agreement objective to limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. The energy sector is a significant contributor to GHG emissions. Dr. Fadi Baral, director of the International Energy Agency, stated earlier this year that the energy that powers our daily lives and our economies also produces three quarters of global emissions. This means our climate challenge is essentially an energy challenge. The global energy system is undergoing a complex transition to decarbonize. Recent energy forecasts published by BP and the International Agency, Energy Agency predict an increase in global energy demand over the coming decades, resulting from factors such as increasing urbanization, growth in emerging economies, and overall global population growth. 
While the future scenarios contemplated in the forecast do not represent a certain crystal ball view to the future, in all scenarios, oil and natural gas remain an important part of the energy mix to 2040 and beyond. According to literature, energy consumed in the oil and gas, in oil and gas sector activities is approximately 10% of the energy produced by the sector. According to literature, energy consumed in oil and gas sector activities is approximately 10% of total energy produced by the sector. The energy needs of the sector are expected to increase due to de decreasing conventional reservoirs and a shift to more energy intensive secondary recovery and non-conventional reservoir development. Approximately 90% of the energy requirements of the sector are derived from oil and gas with the balance supp supplied by, from the electricity grid. It is estimated that scope one and scope two emissions from oil and gas operations represent approximately nine to 15% of total global emissions. The oil and gas sector's challenge with meeting demand while under pressure to reduce or offset emissions intensity from operations. Signs point to those pressures continuing to increase. According to the BP Energy Outlook, if policy, technologies, and social preference continue to evolve at a similar pace as in recent past, it is predicted that globally we will not achieve the GHG emissions reduction re required to meet the Paris Agreement objectives. I have noted some of the broad categories of oil and gas sector decarbonization strategies on the slide. As each oil and gas company is unique, so will be their strategy to decarbonize. There is no one size fits all solution. In renewable energy installations to supply energy for oil and gas operations represents a potential opportunity to fulfill increasing energy requirements while reducing emissions in the sector. It also enables the redirection of oil and gas resources that would be used as energy supply for the oil and gas sector activities to fulfill demand in other sectors or applications. An article titled Application of Solar Energy in the Oil Industry that was published in 2015 predicts that solar energy is estimated to contribute 5% of the energy requirements of, global, of the global oil and gas industry by 2035. And the article predicts that this may increase up to 10% by 2050. Continued decarbonization of Alberta's oil and gas activities is an integral component to meet Canada's emissions reduction requirements. Total GHG emissions generated in Canada were 28 in 2018 were 729 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Under the Paris Agreement, Canada has committed to reducing emissions to 511 million tons by 2030, which represents 30% below 2005 levels. The range of variations since 2005 has seen a high of 742 million tons in 2007 and a low of 680 million tons in 2009. The federal government has stated objectives to meet and exceed Canada's GHG reduction commitments under the Paris Agreement and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Alberta generated 273 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2018. In 2017, the oil and gas sector generated approximately 50% of the province's total emissions as shown in the chart on the slide. Of this total, approximately 95% is attributable to production, processing and transmission, and the balance to petroleum refining and natural gas distribution. Alberta's oil and gas sector has invested significant capital in emissions reduction technologies and innovation with a couple of illustrative examples hitting recent news. Highlighting the importance of robust regional data, a study conducted by life cycle analysis experts from Stanford, the University of Calgary and the University of Toronto indicates that the emissions intensity from upstream oil sands activity is up to 14 to 35% lower than previously published. Additionally, two Alberta companies announced in January 2021 that they are net negative emitters through implementation of carbon capture and storage technologies. As I mentioned, there are policy, investor, and social pressures on the oil and gas sector to continue to decarbonize and achieve net zero emissions. To reduce emissions through carbon pricing, industry compliance, and accountability mechanisms, the federal government has enacted or tabled legislation such as the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, Clean Fuel Standard, and Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. In Alberta, the Technology Innovation Emissions Reduction, or TIER regulation, governs the pricing and trading of industrial emissions in the province. Regulations and directives surrounding methane and fugitive emissions reduction are also in place. In this changing energy landscape, investors are increasingly requiring more robust and transparent corporate environment, social and governance or ESG reporting, including the risk of factors such as climate change on long term corporate performance. Investors are seeking quantifiable action plans aligning with social expectations for companies to generate profit with purpose. Illustrating this, Larry Fink, head of BlackRock, the largest, world's largest asset manager, in his recent letters to CEOs has emphasized sustainability and consideration of material ESG information as integral components to managing risk in the investment portfolios they manage. Additionally, in his most recent letter, he advised that BlackRock is asking companies to disclose business plans that align with the objective of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. The oil and gas sector is responding to the global energy transition, and each company will take a unique approach to decarbonizing. 
Alberta has an abundance of renewable energy resources, including solar, wind, and geothermal energy, supporting the viability of integrating or adopting renewable energy technology into oil and gas sector operations to decrease GHG intensity in certain applications. The integration of renewable energy in the oil and gas sector is not a new concept. Global majors were developing renewable energy technology for integration in their operations in the 1970s and 80s. Efforts and investment have ebbed and flowed with the outlook for oil and gas. Decreasing renewable energy development cost combined with Alberta's favorable electricity market structure and skilled energy workforce support evaluating the potential application of renewable energy generation to supply upstream, midstream, and downstream oil and gas activities. There are various ways an oil and gas company could acquire renewable energy to supply its operations, such as purchasing directly from a retailer, entering into a power purchase agreement, or investing directly in its own renewable energy generation project. Direct investment is scalable from a behind the fence or micro generation project for self supply up to a utility scale grid tied generation project. According to literature, the application of renewable energy technologies in the oil and gas sector is still considered emerging and different options are at varying levels of maturity and viability. A few examples of self supply from the literature with a focus on solar energy applications include solar powered oil pumps, hybrid power systems, solar powered desalination of produced water, and solar PV generation for cathodic protection of pipelines. Some of the potential benefits and considerations of integrating renewable energy and oil and gas sector activities are noted on the slide. These factors will vary based on the unique nature of each company's operations and decarbonization strategy. After working as part of an oil and gas development team, I understand and appreciate that renewable energy installations need to be cost effective and reliable in order to be a viable opportunity for integration as a clean energy source for oil and gas activities. Site-specific conditions also play a significant role. I feel that Alberta's oil and gas sector has the technical expertise as well as the drive to collaborate and innovate, supporting the continued evaluation and advancement of this opportunity as part of a larger decarbonization strategy. Alberta has an abundance of solar energy with an average solar production potential, which is 13% higher than the Canadian average. In the next two slides, I will provide you with some examples of energy storage and solar projects located in Alberta that are at different stages of development to get you thinking about how renewable energy installations could supply the oil and gas sector energy requirements. Energy storage technologies are evolving and storage deployment supports enhanced reliability of renewable energy installations. The first two projects noted are not directly associated to solar energy installations, however, represent examples of projects that address the intermittent nature of some renewable energy generation. NMAX has partnered with GE to construct Canada's first hybrid electric turbine at its Crossfield Energy Centre. The project will integrate a natural gas turbine with a 10 megawatt or 4.3 megawatt hour battery energy storage system. The system will allow the generator to provide operating reserves without burning fuel and support the growth of renewable energy development in the province. The project is expected to eliminate 274,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. In mid-October 2020, Transalta announced that its wind charger battery storage project located at the company's Summerview Wind Farm near Pincher Creek was operational. The project is comprised of 10 megawatts of lithium ion battery storage with a total storage capacity of 20 megawatt hours. The next four projects I will I will introduce represent various ways that companies in the oil and gas sector are investing in solar energy generation projects. Enbridge is directly investing in a 10.5 megawatt ground mount solar power plant, which is under construction near the hamlet of Burdett between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. The power will be used to supply a portion of the company's mainline pipeline network energy requirements. The power plant is tentatively to be complete and operational in April 2021, and it is estimated to offset approximately 12,000 tons of GHG emissions annually. According to press releases and TC Energy's corporate sustainability report, the company has entered into an eight-year power purchase agreement for approximately 75 megawatts of capacity from a 132 megawatt ground mount solar PV power, power plant located just east of Claire's home. I understand this solar project was connected in late January 2021. TC Energy has also proposed an innovative utility scale solar plus storage facility in Alderside. The pilot would have 10 megawatts of capacity plus a 5 megawatt flow battery storage system with total storage capacity up to 40 megawatt hours. There is room to expand the project up to 95 megawatts of capacity along with the additional storage capacity. In 2015, Imaginea Energy engaged Skyfire to install 50 kilowatt solar PV installations on two active well sites, offsetting approximately 38 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. 
This behind the meter project is shown in the photo on the slide and David Kelly will provide you with more information on this in his presentation. A further opportunity is the repurposing of existing oil and gas infrastructure and sites for renewable energy generation. The renewal project team and its partners are piloting the repurposing of two well sites in the Tabor area through deployment of small scale solar PV installations. This opportunity to turn liabilities into assets could be leveraged by oil and gas companies to power existing operations and mitigate greenfield land use for renewable energy development. Understanding that decarbonizing the energy sector is not an either or proposition, I believe Alberta can be a leader in renewable energy development while continuing to innovate and reduce the carbon intensity of its non-renewable resources. There are scalable opportunities for integration between the sectors. I hope that these example projects help demonstrate some of the ways that renewable energy installations could supply energy needs in the oil and gas sector activities and reduce emissions intensity in support of the energy transition. Thank you again for your time and tuning into today's webinar and my apologies for the technical difficulties. It is my pleasure to now pass the floor over to Keith, who will provide you with more information on the Renewal Project and the exciting momentum that's building around it. Uh, well, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk about the Renewal Project today in the Solar Alberta webinar, and appreciative for the great introduction that uh, Alyssa has given to, uh, to the overall scope. As it's, uh, everybody's fairly familiar, we're in a, a unique situation in Alberta where our oil production is higher than it's ever been, but this is largely due to the explosion of, um, of, uh, of uh, production that's occurred in the bitumen areas in northern Alberta. But um, the major part of uh, Alberta's conventional um, recovery has been in decline since the mid-70s. And in spite of a major uh, drilling campaign that happened between 2010 and 2019, um, there was no recovery in the um, production of conventional oil and gas in the southern part of the province. So this has uh, caused some ma major economic and uh, social impact in, in this part of the province. And one of the big part, um, most obvious aspects of this um, is uh, a lot of oil companies going out of business, a uh, high percentage of inactive wells in the southern portion of the province and also up in the Rainbow Lake and, and uh, other light oil areas. Um, in fact, there's over 160,000 leases currently, oil and gas leases in the province that are inactive. And based on an average of about two and a half acres per lease, this is over 320,000 acres of land that needs to be reclaimed. And that's not counting the facilities. Um, liabilities for this um, uh, legacy infrastructure have been estimated somewhere between 34 billion and 70 billion dollars. And there is a real footprint on the land associated with, uh, with this um, legacy infrastructure. These are photos uh, by Brian Pierce at the MD of Tabor, and, um, uh, which is a traditional uh, conventional oil production area. Um, and what we see is that uh, due to these, uh, this legacy infrastructure and these mature and depleted fields, we have a lot of problems. For example, orphan wells where companies have, uh, have gone bankrupt and left the, uh, the um, facilities and wells unreclaimed. Um, landowners are being impacted in terms of uh, not having lease payments made, um, weed issues on the land. Uh, sometimes there's contamination issues and the surface rights board has been um, over subscribed for uh, um, payments to landowners for, uh, for these missing rental payments. And the municipality, the MDF Tabor alone, uh, has uh, more than $1.75 million of unpaid taxes in 2019 alone. And the Rural Municipalities Association um, have uh, documented more than $80 million of unpaid municipal taxes throughout the province. This is just some of the examples of the way that facilities have been left. And there's been, unfortunately, very little support for landowners um, as weeds are leaving um, the um, existing leases and moving into the fields. Well, we see a lot of other uh, opportunities though in the province and part of this is due to the major breakthroughs that have happened in solar over the past uh, decade. Um, one of the really intriguing things in 2017, uh, solar was declared as cost equivalent with uh, fossil fuel um, and many solar large scale solar projects started coming out at uh, record low prices. Uh, in fact, we saw um, incredibly low prices for the Alberta infrastructure bid from Canadian Solar under five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and the US Department of Energy in 2010 um, had forecast that uh, uh, the utility scale solar would reach $1 per watt installed 
by 2020, and they set up an aggressive uh, research program and funding program to try to achieve this goal. And by 2017, they had already, or 2018, they had already broken that record. And now we're well below $1 watt for uh, utility scale solar installation in the US. Now, one of the issues though is uh, in order to get the low costs on solar projects, one of the um, patterns that has evolved is that the upfront work, whether you're talking, you know, the permitting and the um, regulatory approvals and so on, is essentially the same, whether you're talking a one megawatt project or a hundred megawatt project. So large scale projects, and this is also true in the wind industry, um, are, pro, are able to prorate that development cost. But one of the issues that then occurs is these large scale projects often require transmission upgrades. And the transmission costs in Alberta have tripled over the past uh, 10 years. And this is causing a major impact on, uh, on all electricity users in the province and particularly the irrigation communities in Southern Alberta, which I'll touch on later. So what we came up with in terms of the renewal project is we're in this situation where the province, uh, the previous government was requesting a 30% renewable energy uh, generation of the province by 2030. And that was a roughly 5,000 megawatts of um, planned development. This would require about 35,000 acres if this was all at, the, at that time, the, the ratio was about seven acres per megawatt. So we've got about 35,000 acres for solar. At the same time, we have 155,000 or over 160,000 now in active wells with over 300,000 acres requiring reclamation. So about 10% of the um, abandoned infrastructure, if, that, uh, if those leases were reused for solar, this would give us the uh, entire budget for the um, uh, renewable energy plan. So if we look at things, we, we uh, essentially, if you look at a large scale project and the largest one in the province right now is the Greengate uh, project, which has been announced and will be going to, into construction soon. That's a 400 megawatt project and it will occupy approximately 2000 acres. It turns out that if we converted about 25% of the inactive leases in the MD of Tabor, um, uh, two acres or two and a half acres per site, we would also generate 400 megawatts of, uh, of solar electricity. Work. And in this case, we would not be removing any land from agriculture. So we, I've been working on this idea, I guess, since about 2015. Um, and uh, I've gone through very uh, many levels with the uh, Alberta Energy Regulator and Alberta Environment and so on. And we reached a point um, at the beginning of um, 2019 that uh, we were given the opportunity to develop an orphan well location uh, in the MD of Tabor. And uh, at that point in time, we found that there was no um, regulatory framework or no policy framework for municipal governments to be able to evaluate or approve these developments. And so at that time, we um, applied to the Municipal Climate Change Action Center with the MD of Tabor, um, and we were awarded funding under the Community Generation Capacity Building Program. Um, and this allowed us to basically come up with a series of templates and processes uh, to examine all of these various issues uh, in terms of land use, taxation, emergency response, and so on, related to converting um, inactive and abandoned oil and gas leases for solar conversion. The biggest portion of this work was, uh, was related to stakeholder consultation. And through that uh, year-long exercise, we had very strong support from landowners, Alberta Energy, Energy Regulator, the Orphan Well Association, Alberta Agriculture, Alberta Environment Parks, uh, the AUC, Alberta Utility Commission, ECLAS, and also the renewable energy industry. And we found increasing support, initially some hesitation, but increasing support from the oil and gas sector. And then now um, as part of the whole process of uh, distribution, distributed generation versus transmission generation and so on, there's a lot of activities going on in the, uh, in the electric, electrical utility sector. Um, as we're finishing that project, another uh, program came forward with the, uh, from the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. And this one was called the uh, Municipal Community Generation um, uh, uh, Challenge. And uh, we applied for funding under that program as well and were awarded $2.1 million. Um, and that was announced in, in August of this year. And it will enable us to build two megawatts of solar generation on uh, between two and four. It will turn out to be two uh, orphan well leases in the MD of Tabor. And IRCAM will be, uh, which I'll mention in a moment, it will be the owner of the sites. So IRCAN is um, the power generation arm of three of uh, Southern Alberta's irrigation districts, the St. Mary River, Tabor, and Raymond irrigation districts. They currently oper operate three run of river hydro facilities on the main canal that generate power during irrigation season. 
And they're providing $1.5 million in funding to this project in return for ownership of the uh, solar generation facilities. And this is really important in Southern Alberta because um, there's tremendous irrigation load uh, for electricity in the Southern part of the province um, due to the electric pivot irrigation systems and pumping systems. And it also turns out these are all very high solar um, uh, insulation areas. And another factor about irrigation is the hotter and drier the year, the more irrigation demand there is. So the more electricity that's used, but those are also the years that have the highest solar generation. So there's a very nice alignment with solar. In terms of our specific project, we're gonna be building um, two megawatts of solar on abandoned oil well leases. Our goals are to be increase the distribution generation support in the irrigation community, um, conserving land for agriculture, accelerate some of the oil reclamation that needs to be done in the southern part of the province, and create employment and economic diversification opportunities, as well as to generate revenue for the MD of Tabor and the irrigation districts. And so we hope to prove the concept of this uh, uh, lease conversion idea, improve regulatory clarity for moving forward, and improve the capacity um, of solar to improve the capacity of solar to offset transmission buildup. We'll be able to put um, about, turned out at the beginning of this, about 500 kilowatts on the 2.5 acre lease. Now we can get about 700 kilowatts, which is a testament to uh, how rapidly uh, the solar technology is improving. And you can see the numbers that we would generate from the specific pilot, as well as there's tremendous opportunity um, in converting 33, if we were to convert 33% of the uh, uh, leases in, in the MD of Tabor, uh, it has pretty significant numbers in terms of over 500 megawatts of solar generation capacity. So there's a lot of benefits for the MD, some uh, way of getting uh, more rapid attention on this uh, over 300,000 inactive wells that are there, accelerate some of the oil field reclamation activities, um, and it would generate more than $1.1 million in property taxes a year, which would offset some of the uh, shortfall from oil and gas. Over the whole province, um, apply, if we're, this was applied to only 10% of the inactive leases, this would be more than um, 6,200 megawatts of solar generation capacity and some pretty significant economic benefits. Now, one thing that we are just looking at though is kind of a broader scope, instead of just dealing with these end of life fields, is that many of the uh, mature reservoirs in Southern Alberta still have a significant amount of, of oil that has not been produced. And this is conventional oil, oil, oil that can easily flow through pipelines without diluent and, uh, and additional pipeline capacity that's needed for bitumen. Um, and it's easier oil to refine and has higher market value. Uh, essentially, the primary and water flood recovery stages of these mature fields only produces about 15% of the oil in place. But there have been some pilots with CO2 uh, and with um, uh, alkaline surfactant flooding in some of the Alberta fields, southern Alberta fields. And this has shown that an additional 30% of the oil can be recovered. Um, but one of the big issues here is that it's, it is very energy intensive. And one of the big costs on, on these uh, enhanced recovery schemes is electricity. Um, a pilot project, which is actually under our family farm in uh, south of Tabor, uh, was operated by Husky, um, showed that they required more than 1,100 megawatt hours per year to operate the pumps for the, um, uh, for the enhanced recovery scheme. Um, now, by coupling solar, for example, if, uh, if, um, if 12 of the um, unreclaimed leases were converted to solar, under a microgen scheme, um, it would generate enough electricity to offset a significant portion of the uh, pumping load. Um, and over under in less than uh, seven years, it would pay for itself um, as opposed to just buying electricity from the grid. And also it would reduce the greenhouse gas intensity of the oil that's produced because it wouldn't be using um, coal generated electricity for, uh, for pumping operations. Now there's a, a worldwide need for this service. Alberta is not the only jurisdiction in the world that's dealing with uh, uh, a legacy of um, conventional energy infrastructure. Um, and in 2019, the World Energy Council published a brief on this and David Hardy from the Alberta Energy Regulator was one of the primary authors. And it turns out there's more than $300 billion of market for this type of service um, in, in the world. And as well, one of the great things is not only is this a cost saving for both renewable and um, conventional energy industries, but also the embedded carbon and embedded energy in that infrastructure is reused rather than um, having to start from scratch again. 
So in summary, our idea is to bring together all the various aspects, which is one of the things Alberta has always been so good at, to um, actually create and develop this idea and, and put Alberta again as a world leader, and this time in the integration of conventional and renewable energy systems. I'd like to acknowledge the MD of Tabor and the AER, Alberta Surface Rights Association, the landowner groups, Orphan Well Association and the Renewal Project Team, which includes uh, Iron and Earth, which does uh, job retraining for uh, oil and gas industry workers to work in renewables um, and Indigenous workers, as well as Skyfire has been involved in this since the beginning, New Wave Industries on the oil field abandonment. And, uh, and the, finally, the uh, Municipal Climate Change Action Centre for all the great support they provide. So our vision at Skyfire is to bring the magic of solar power to the world for a stronger, healthier and more sustainable global community. Um, I struggle with the word magic when our marketing people came up with it. And, but the magic is seeing the joy in somebody's face when their meter's running backwards and they're producing energy from the sun. So it's, it's, it's a pretty magical moment when that happens. So why solar? Why are we seeing companies looking at solar? So lower energy costs is the primary um, goal and on grid, we're seeing lower levelized cost of energy. I'll speak a little bit about that. Uh, with carbon tax increasing, it will make solar even more attractive. Off-grid, lower costs than running a generator or running power lines. So prior to the Green Energy Act and the FIT program in Ontario, the largest consumer of solar modules in the country was sites like this here, uh, where we've got solar modules powering a well site, running the SCADA system. And uh, you know, that's still a fantastic way to bring power to a remote site. And we're seeing you know, with the price of solar module falling, that solar can deliver energy onto our grid uh, at a lower cost than most other generation today. And the IEA has recognized that uh, just uh, this past year. Uh, reliability, solar plus storage can increase electrical re reliability at remote sites. So acting like a microgrid uh, with the storage on site. And there's some advantages as we're seeing, you know, more and more storage come onto the grid as like solar storage prices have fallen tremendously over the last couple of years. The other piece that we're seeing companies move towards solar energy is ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So they're looking at, you know, what are our goals as a company to reduce our emissions? And many of Alberta's oil and gas companies and producers have ESG mandates. And we're seeing a higher adoption rate in Canada uh, than we are in the U.S. So we may see that change with the new, uh, new government in the U.S., but uh, the Canadian uh, ESG adoption rate has grown quite significantly. So there's a couple of ways to, to get solar power for oil operations or, or, or different other sites, whether it be manufacturing. Today we're talking about oil and gas. So purchase it financing or leasing on site behind the meter. So you're actually putting the solar array on your physical site, like we would with the Renewal project. Um, in Alberta, you can install up to five megawatts under our microgeneration act for load behind the meter. And we can aggregate energy consuming sites into one solar project. So say we had you know, a number of operating wells uh, on the same name distribution line, we could build one larger solar project to deliver energy for all those uh, well sites on that distribution line. So, you know, building it where you need it, so distributed solar. The other way to do it is through a power purchase agreement. So the energy consumer doesn't have to own the asset. They can have an agreement with the system owner to purchase energy. And so I've got a photo here of the Claire's Home Solar Project. It's 173 megawatts DC, 135, I believe, AC, or 132, sorry, AC. Claire's Home Solar uh, has signed an agreement with Trans or TC Energy under a power purchase agreement for 74 of those 132 megawatts. And I assume the other portion of that will be delivered to the Alberta grid and sold as merchant energy. So a couple different ways to do it. Uh, the energy in this case gets delivered through the Alberta grid. So it doesn't have to be right next door. So under our microgen act, uh, we can connect to offset our own load. So it's for self-generation. Uh, we can do up to five megawatts. That was recently increased from a one megawatt cap. The net billing uh, policy we have is at the retail rate for less than 150 kilowatts. It is at pool price for bigger than 150 kilowatt systems. And again, we can aggregate on the same name distribution line. And uh, a link there to the AUC website with details on the Microgeneration Act.
When we talk about the cost of solar, um, we like to speak in levelized cost of energy. We're comparing the cost of solar to the cost of grid power. So we take the cost of the solar, financing cost, maintenance cost, municipal taxes, and all the other pieces that go into uh, the cost of that energy being delivered to yourself. Uh, we divide it by the energy production over 25 years. And we're seeing that cost fall uh, precipitously. Um, Keith spoke about Canadian solar being less than five cents a kilowatt hour, selling energy to the Alberta government and very, very inexpensive energy and making money doing that. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to see that um, those systems, you know, when we're starting get, to get into the dollar a watt range for, for installed cost of a system. If we compare solar LCOE between four cents and 15 cents, uh, you know, for smaller projects, um, the cost will be higher. Uh, compare that to grid power, Western Canadian grid costs anywhere between nine cents and 17 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're, we're already there. We have reached that grid parity point, uh, certainly in Alberta, uh, BC in some locations and in Saskatchewan. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting times for the solar industry. I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the sites that we've built and others have talked about earlier. Uh, the Imaginea Energy sites, uh, we built a couple of 50, mega, or 50 kilowatt projects. So very small compared to what we're looking at with Renewell. These provide about 70% of the site's energy. So you know, we've got a single well in the center of this uh, property. It's 110 meters by 110 meters, a couple of rows of solar modules, and it's tied in. It's a grid tied system. So we're producing energy uh, from the solar, delivering it to the distribution panel on the site. It either gets used by the well or gets sent back to the grid under the Microgen Act. And then uh, at night, obviously we're pulling from the grid. There's no storage involved. So a very, very simple system. Uh, in this case, we did a, a single high row of modules. Uh, we designed and fabricated our own ballast system for this. The second site, we used a lock block solution and attached a conventional rack to the lock blocks. We went too high. One of the interesting things on the first site, uh, no issues with birds. The second site, because this is the highest thing in the, in the field, the birds tend to sit on the peak and uh, do what birds do. And so just interesting, some of the things that we're learning um, as we build more and more projects and uh, learn more about what happens with solar in different sites around Alberta. Alyssa spoke about the Enbridge project. So Skyfire with our uh, joint venture partner is building this project. Uh, we've got about two more days of module installation and the modules will all be installed. So this project um, is about 70 acres. Uh, it's using a Morgan Solar, so a Canadian company out of Toronto developed the Simba X spot technology uh, for the modules. So it's a, a, a new design of module that we're, we're installing. Fairly conventional uh, helical screw piles, um, roll form steel racking. And so about 36,000 modules. And again, 13.6 uh, megawatts DC, 10 and a half megawatts AC. And that should be commissioned in about the next month or so. So very exciting, uh, our biggest project to date. And that is owned by Enbridge. So it's gonna offset some of their uh, pipeline operations um, energy requirements. So I'll talk a little bit about the elephant in the room. Uh, is solar a threat to the oil and gas industry? And it's not so much solar itself, it's the end use. So oil's primary use is for transportation fuel. Uh, gas and diesel powered vehicles are not going away tomorrow. And oil is gonna continue to be a source of raw materials for polymers um, and other products uh, that use petroleum as a base for their manufacture. So polymers, um, rubber, asphalt roads. But we're seeing internal combustion engine vehicle bans being implemented across the globe. Manufacturers are committing to EV production. GM just recently announced by 2035, I believe, uh, they will be 100% EV production. And EV sales are climbing. Uh, peak gas car production was reached in 2017. So if we're looking at the market for oil, um, you know, that transportation piece of it is, is declining. So the actual threat to the oil and gas industry is, is, is not from solar or electricity in general. It's, it's from the, the transition to electric powered vehicles. We're seeing it in cars, trucks, transport trucks, 
and even aircraft. Uh, Harbor Air is now piloting uh, a lithium ion electric uh, de Havilland Beaver uh, to run the Vancouver to Victoria route. And uh, it's working. It's, you know, we're not going to see that, you know, transcontinental aircraft move to electric anytime soon, I don't think, but it, it may come one day as battery technology improves. We look at the cost as well. So if we were to take $100 worth of gasoline and $100 worth of electricity, either from, you know, 11 cent a kilowatt hour from the grid, rough numbers for Western Canada, or seven and a half cents from an average residential, uh, you know, a good residential solar install. So driving a gas powered car, we'd travel, you know, something in the 800 to 1000 kilometer range, driving, uh, you know, a nicer electric car, we're going to be over 4,000 kilometers on that $100 worth of grid power and over 6,000 kilometers on $100 worth of solar power. So it's, it's, it's an economic uh, decision to move to electric vehicles. And it, it's, it's going to be a game changer in transportation uh, across the world. So solar and natural gas. So we talk a little bit about oil, we're talking a little bit about natural gas. So if we look at, you know, the production of solar in particular uh, with a single axis tracker, we kind of flare out towards the ends of the day a little bit more with a fixed array, we peak around noon. And we see a lot of graphs that get published and they kind of cut off here. Uh, the reality is we don't have solar power at night. It's, it's an intermittent resource, obviously. And so gas generation is filling in that gap in Alberta today. Uh, as we see more and more solar come onto the grid, uh, that gas generation will fill in those piece, pieces. And the interesting thing is, you know, the more electricity we generate by solar in Alberta, the more gas we have to export. And it's good for Alberta. We have a limited capacity to export electricity through tie lines to our neighbors, uh, but we have the ability to export gas. And so that's great for Alberta. So oil and gas uh, have served us well for the last 100 plus years and will continue to provide uh, energy and raw material for a long time into the future. We're seeing oil and gas firms now investing in solar projects, wind projects, and EVs. So Enbridge, obviously, with the uh, Alberta Solar One project, TC Energy has solar projects uh, around North America. Shell has just uh, started building a, or I'm not sure how far along it is, a solar at the Scottford refinery site. Uh, Suncor has solar and wind projects under development. Uh, EV charging stations are being built in Petro-Canada stations across uh, the Trans-Canada Highway, and companies like Tech have committed to replacing their 900 pickup truck fleet uh, with EVs by 2025. So we're seeing a lot of this happen uh, in, in, in Alberta and Western Canada. And there we go, time, a little time for question and answers. In renewables, and I think so too, it'd be nice if you could speak about some of the employment opportunities that you folks are making available and, um, and just touch on that a bit. I think there might be a lot of attendees looking with excitement at your projects and thinking about making a, a bit of a switch themselves. Um, yes, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, we're partners with Iron and Earth um, as part of uh, this project. And uh, together with uh, Medicinac College, Iron and Earth has put together a uh, two week and, and with uh, also a lot of help and support from Skyfire, I have to say, um, and uh, also New Wave Industries, put together a two week uh, training program, which will be held uh, later this year, probably May or June will be the first time it's held. And uh, it will um, effectively, uh, we have the mandate to train uh, 15 Indigenous and, and oil and gas, uh, people from the oil and gas industry uh, for part of this first uh, training intake. And uh, part of that work will be done uh, in uh, the installation of the first projects in the MD of Tabor. Um, so uh, Iron and Earth has certainly uh, been our main conduit for kind of interfacing with the, the labor market. And they're certainly going through a, a expansion phase right now. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, effectively, I, I do appreciate that this is one of the things as many of us who've uh, come into the solar industry from oil and gas, and it is a bit of a transition sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess it's something as things are expanding, there'll be more um, uh, room for growth and these kinds of opportunities, but certainly um, you would be open to talking to people about volunteering opportunities as well as uh, Iron and Earth is, uh, is a, a fantastic resource for that. So I would definitely uh, welcome any uh, contact as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, would recommend contacting Iron and Earth. 
Yeah, thank you, Keith. And I know for folks wanting to show and demonstrate to employees, um, it's, uh, there, there are lots of questions about the reliability of the power supply, what happens during downtime, uh, you know, what is the second life of PV panels when replaced? Yeah, we've got this fairly reliable uh, nuclear reactor about 93 million miles away. Uh, it comes up every morning, sets every evening, and uh, it, it, it provides the energy for the solar. Uh, we sold a module just as a co conversion device. So modules are quite reliable. Um, most manufacturers are providing anywhere between a 25 or 30 year performance warranty. And we expect modules to last 30, 40 years um, easily. Uh, there is a startup recycling facility in Alberta that is uh, just starting up. Uh, haven't had to recycle a whole lot of solar modules yet. Uh, because there haven't, they haven't been installed for 30 to 40 years. Uh, certainly there has been some, maybe in the early days of the oil and gas SCADA uh, side, there was some pretty ancient modules, but uh, most of the modules that have been built are still operating. So there hasn't been a need for recycling. Certainly we're going to need that in the future as we um, you know, move 20, 30 years down the road when some of these large solar farms will be replacing the solar modules. You know, if we look at uh, the racking and the in-ground wiring that's been buried, most of those things should still be functional and uh, we can repopulate that solar array. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know I, I did see a press release go out from the government of Alberta. I think it was last May or April about the uh, the new the new recycling of, of mm -hmm. solar, along with many other products that they're right. they're new newly recycling, and it was nice to see uh, we're in the mix, and so yep. uh, to see that there's some leadership there uh, provincially as well is great. I have a question here. I think might be a really good one for you, Alyssa. It's around uh, the drivers from the oil and gas industry. So, what are some of the the drivers making making folks supportive of this and pushing pushing people and saying, hey? Um, you know, we're willing to consider this. Why, why is oil and gas sector and why are some of those folks willing to, to shift and, and think about this now and, and maybe newly and not in the past so much? Um, I think I alluded to this question a little bit in my presentation and, and from what I was um, reading in the research and the literature is there's really drivers from a few different um, avenues. So there's the social front where um, with millennials coming up in the investment world, looking for companies to generate that profit with purpose, um, as well as the um, policy front where there's legislation driving, um, driving up the cost of carbon emissions, um, looks to uh, oil and gas companies to find innovative solutions to reducing the emissions intensity from their, from their operations as well. So as well as from the investment front, just on the ESG reporting, I have I keep seeing articles popping up about the importance of ESG and, um, and as well as investment um, firms looking at that as, as a, a risk, um, as well as climate risk in their evaluations of, of companies um, go forward. Looking at the cost comparison for solar installation on individual lease reclamation sites, as compared to large scale installations. So wondering if you could comment on some of the cost uh, comparison or differences there. Who wants yeah, to so take a typically step? the larger the project, uh, the lower the cost. Um, you know, you're doing engineering work, you're doing geotechnical work, looking at uh, pile testing program for each site. Uh, having to do that across multiple sites will certainly drive the cost up. Um, the equipment itself should be fairly similar priced, obviously, uh, if we're doing, you know, a 10 megawatt site or 10 one megawatt sites, the equipment should be very similar in price. It's that soft cost, that upfront engineering cost that's going to drive up um, those smaller site costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely uh, concur with that. Um, you know, as we were doing the, the business modeling around this idea, um, effectively, there's, there's pros and cons. We get a little bit of a um, you know, some regulatory um, uh, easement because uh, keeping sites under one megawatt, we don't have to go through some of the uh, um, more rigorous uh, rule seven type of AUC um, barriers. But also, uh, you know, one of the advantages is by not having to put roads and power lines in. Um, and um, 
uh, being able to do very repeatable pro size projects like engineering being very similar in every project. If we can keep a large number of the sites in a current building season in a similar area, we feel we can come pretty close to the utility scale cost. Um, but this is really what the pilots are to prove. And so we'll know better at the end of this year if we can actually make that happen. Thank you. Yeah. I see, I, I suspect a number of, we have a 45% in attendance today are professionals in the uh, industry. And so I think some of our questions are, a little bit uh, professional in nature, but I'm going to ask one for the for the solar curious folks because uh, it's always top of my mind. Why why uh, projects like this? You know, hearing about solar at a uh, on a brownfield site such as a, an orphaned oil and gas uh, well. You know, I wonder is there are, are there any hope or plans of integrating that type of project as a requirement? Uh, as a, a standard requirement uh, for reclamation of those sites when, when new ones go in. Uh, has there been any discussion about that in the future or is it always just gonna be an add-on sort of after the fact? Uh, we haven't seen any movement towards any kind of, uh, any um, actually regulatory push in that direction, I would say. It's a great idea because, uh, you know, as we did, did a lot of our initial business modeling work with uh, Skyfire as well as with New Wave Industries, and uh, from the uh, well closure side, there's significant savings to be had by this too. So, um, uh, you know, I, if there isn't a put external push, I think there's an economic uh, advantage for, uh, for looking at this from, from the oil and gas operation side. So I know certainly uh, the Orphan Well Association would like to prove that out and we'll see how it comes out. How does the change in distribution credits available to distribution generators impact this program? And do you see this as a risk to future plans or what are possible mitigations? And I'm going to add, because some people might not know what are distribution credit credits. So if you could add that at the outset of the question and, and then dive in, I think that would be appreciated. I, I would love to take that one because, um, you know, we have the, the distribution credit is something that exists. Um, it actually goes back to an oil and gas liability mitigation that happened in the 1990s. Um, when Alberta was at a stage where we were opening up a lot of the uh, uh, production um, in parts of the province, there was a solution gas problem where quite a bit of gas was being produced and, and the old solution would have been to flare that gas. And uh, the AER didn't want that to happen, or what is now the AER. And so there were regulations put on saying that if you produce solution gas, if you were close enough to power lines, you actually had to generate electricity and sell it to the grid. Um, and um, as they were doing that, we were also going through deregulation and we were in this new system where there's a meter at the substation that measures how much energy is coming off the transmission line. And then at the distribution level, they measure how much energy has gone to customers. And that should tie, you should have the same amount of energy coming off transmission as what's sold to the customers in distribution. But what they found in the early days is in areas where there were these flare gas generators, um, that there was a mismatch, that basically the flare gas generators were providing the electricity to the local distribution network and that they didn't have to buy it from the transmission system. So that meant there was a credit that came out of that. And at that time, the EUB, Alberta Utility Board, mandated that that credit be paid to the generators because as part of their decision, they said not only is that, are they generating that good, but also they're providing a, a greater environmental service under regulation and they should receive the credit for that. So that's where the, the, the history of the option and redistribution credits can come from. We're now experiencing this funny time where there's pushback against that. Um, and I think largely on behalf of the transmission companies, because as we're moving more to transmit to distributed generation, there's less need for some of the transmission that's out there. And there's a strong fear of stranded assets. Mm -hmm. And so in, in order to recover the cost of the transmission build out, there's strong pressure to erode away the distribution connected credits. Um, this is a threat to the entire distribution connected renewable energy industry. And if we look at where things are in places like Europe, where you're moving more to putting generation closer to load um, and then the local storage things that are coming in as well, local storage solutions, um, this is gonna be a major issue and has been through the Alberta Utility Commission. And it's a risk to all development, whether you're on the transmission side or whether you're on the distribution side. If we don't have strong guidance in this area, um, it's a risk to all of the investment. Well, thank you for that, Keith. And 
I think this question might uh, might fit into your the research you've done, Alyssa. But so there's some folks wondering how are oil and gas greenhouse gas emissions calculated? Is it upstream, downstream, whole cycle? You know, when we're when we're talking or referencing those in in, in presentations, uh, what what are those calculations based on? So the data that I had in my quoted in my presentation was from Environment Climate Change Canada and reported on the Canada Energy Regulator website. So um, the emissions data for Alberta was by sector and it incorporated upstream, midstream and downstream activities. So it was the, the number or the percentage that I quoted was primarily derived from upstream and midstream um, emissions. I believe it is full life cycle, but I was just trying to look that up while I was sitting here because oh, I yeah. think that question, question come into bumping up the bumping <laughs> up the popularity there. And so I'll certainly take that away and um, can confirm and, and comment and share um, if that that's a, a possibility. Down the road, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And uh, and I had another question. I know you touched on this briefly, Keith, but I think there are a lot of people uh, who are concerned that as they see solar expanding across rural Alberta, they're worried about arable land. You know, they're worried about our our local food. They're worried about making sure that we can produce what we eat here, and of course that we maintain the livelihood livelihoods of farmers well beyond just their ability to produce solar power. And so I'm wondering if a few folks could comment a bit on how, you know, how you're thinking about that and, and how you're integrating that into your work and making sure that our agriculture industry, which I believe is the second largest industry in Alberta outside the energy sector, remains viable and that we're not sacrificing um, good, good farmland for the sake of solar power generation. Yeah, that's that's uh, extremely important to me, partly because my family is also a farming family in southern Alberta, so um, I, I get that. And uh, you know, one of the things, as I as I showed in the slide, we need only a small percentage, like ten percent, of all of the land that's already been earmarked and taken out of agriculture and other uses from the oil and gas from the energy industry only 10% of that would, would provide what we need. And the other part is that, as, as most people are aware, uh, the leases that oil and gas, uh, lease payments that oil and gas uh, uh, producers pay to landowners is based upon the equivalent um, value that they could get from farming that land. So if you're in high quality irrigated cultivated land, um, you get paid a higher rental payment than if you're in dry land or, or um, a poor producing pasture or something like that. Well, for our purposes, we actually like to be in places like pivot corners or in lower quality agricultural land because we prefer to have um, lower lease payments. And those are also the areas closest to the roads where the power lines are. So it's the easiest for us to develop. Um, so there's a nice, uh, it's one of the things we learned in our, in our conversation with landowners. And then there's another thing that is uh, very important is that um, like our family as well, we, we actually get rent from the oil companies for the leases on our farm. Um, and, uh, and so some landowners when they're, they, in, in some cases, in many cases, if it's poor quality agricultural land, they get more money from the oil and gas lease than they would get from farming that land. And then that um, auxiliary income helps support the farming operation. Um, and the other part I touched on is that uh, the big majority of our, even though it's not the majority of our agricultural land, the majority of our agricultural production in Southern Alberta comes from the irrigated land. Mm -hmm. And in that, those cases, electricity costs are one of their major um, economic hurdles right now. And so the more that we can get distribution connected um, generation within the irrigation areas, the less push there will be to upgrade the transmission system. And then it's been that rolling cost of transmission upgrades that's been driving the cost of power up. The energy cost hasn't changed since deregulation. It's still about five, six cents per kilowatt hour, but the delivery costs have gone from two cents to 12 cents uh, for the irrigation farmers. Mm 